Revelation chapter 6. And we're going to read the chapter together. And I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard, as it were, the noise of thunder, one of the four beasts saying, Come and see. And I saw, and behold, a white horse, and he that sat on him had a bow, and a crown was given unto him, and he went forth conquering and to conquer. Who's that? Who is it? Oh, I like it. Well done. Um, And when he had opened the second seal, I heard the second beast say, Come and see. And there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat thereon to take peace from the earth, and that they should kill one another. And there was given unto him a great sword. Who's opening the seals? Correct. Well done. And when he had opened the third seal, I heard the third beast say, Come and see. And I beheld, beheld, and lo, a black horse, and he that sat on him had a pair of balances in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four beasts say, A measure of wheat for a penny, and three measures of barley for a penny. And see thou hurt not the oil and the wine. When he had opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth beast say, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and his name that sat on him was Death. And hell followed with him, and power was given unto them over the fourth part of the earth to kill with sword, and with hunger, and with death, and with the beasts of the earth. And when he had opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given unto every one of them, and it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. And the heaven departed as a scroll, when it rolled together, and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. The kings of the earth, and the great men, and the rich men, and the chief captains, and the mighty men, and every bondman, and every free man, hid themselves in the dens and in the rocks of the mountains. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come, and who is able to stand. We're picking up from verse 12 and 13. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind." These events precede the end of the tribulation. Note that. These events are connected with heavenly phenomena in the sun, moon and stars. And they match the warnings of the Lord Jesus Christ in the Gospels. Let's turn to Matthew 24. Matthew chapter 24, verse Twenty-nine, Matthew twenty-four, twenty-nine. Immediately after the tribulation of those days shall the sun be darkened and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven and the powers of the heavens shall be shaken. Luke 21. Luke 21, verse 25. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth Distress of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring. Mark 13. Mark 13. Verse 24. But in those days, after that tribulation, the sun shall be darkened and the moon shall not give her light. And we go 25. And the stars of heaven shall fall and the powers that are in heaven shall be shaken. Verse 26. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds with great power and glory. And this is where the post-millennialists and amillennialists get confused. They think that Acts 2, turn there, Acts chapter 2. 
Verse 16 to 21 is a reference to the first advent. Acts 2, 16 to 21. And his name through faith in his... No, that's 3, sorry. 16. But this is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. Was He says Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, saith God, I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh... And your sons and your daughters shall prophesy, and your young men shall see visions, and your old men shall dream dreams. And again, the Charismatics and the Pentecostals claim that one for today. And on my servants and on my handmaids, maidens, I will pour out in those days of my spirit, and they shall prophesy. And I will show wonders in heaven above, and signs in the earth beneath, blood and fire and vapour of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness, and the moon into blood, before that great and notable day of the Lord come. So it's a reference, they think it's a reference to the first advent, when it's a reference to the second advent. Again, rightly dividing the scriptures. The references in Acts 2 are dealing with the second coming. But at that time, listen carefully, at that time, the Lord is about to come back. The second advent is looming immediately in Acts 1 to 7. So the Lord could have come back any time between Acts 1 to Acts 7. You need to get that. But then it's postponed until the end of the church age. Turn to Joel chapter 2. <clears throat> Joel chapter 2. Let's just read down a little bit from verse 28. And it should come to pass afterward that I will pour out my spirit upon all flesh and your sons and your daughters shall prophesy and your old men shall dream dreams, your young men shall see visions and also upon the servants and upon the handmaids in those days will I pour out my spirit and I will show wonders in the heavens and in the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood. Therefore the great and the terrible day of the Lord come. Before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. And here... Let's just give you a few notes on these. In those days, verse 28 to 32, matches in those days of Joel 3, verse 1. And the context in either case is the judgment of the nations, Joel 3, verse 1 to 2, following the second advent. So it's talking about the second advent. If you confuse this information, then you'll go for the first advent, which some people do. And there's a lot we could say on Joel, but I need to keep pushing on in regard to this. The heavenly phenomena in Acts 2, verse 16 to 20, does not occur until the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ, as you find it in Revelation 6. Peter quotes this in Acts 2, because the Lord's return was imminent. Then, if they'd have received Stephen's message the Lord would have come back. But they rejected the third person of the Trinity, that was strike three. God the Father in the Old Testament, Jesus Christ at Calvary, the Holy Spirit there in Acts 7. So it's strike three for them. If they'd received him as their Messiah, the second coming would have taken place. So, go back to Revelation 6, verse 12 and 13. It'll hopefully become clearer. I'm hoping that we'll all understand Revelation a little bit better after this tonight, because there's some things in here that are amazing, right, just looking at some of this stuff. So just bear with me. We'll get the nuts and bolts out of the way first, and then we'll break it down a little bit better later on. So, back to Revelation 6, 12 and 13. And behold, and I beheld, when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood, and the stars of heaven fell unto the earth, even as a fig tree casteth her untimely figs, when she is shaken of a mighty wind. Notice the sun becoming black. We've seen supernatural darkness before. If you turn to Exodus chapter 10, and it's going to happen again. Exodus chapter 10. Verse 21 to 23, And the Lord said unto Moses, Stretch out thine hand toward heaven, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even darkness which may be felt. And Moses stretched forth his hand toward heaven, and there was a thick darkness in all the land of Egypt three days. They saw not one another, neither rose any from his place for three days, but all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. That's interesting, isn't it? Egypt, 
type of the world, dark, black, as, as you can get, yet Israel had light in their dwellings. The children of God had light in their dwellings. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. The word of God. So even though the darker it gets, just being spiritually um, up to date here, the darker it gets, because we've got the word of God, we've got light in our dwellings through the scriptures. But we saw supernatural darkness there in Exodus 10 that covered Egypt for three days. Then we saw supernatural darkness again for the second time in Matthew 27. Turn there, Matthew 27, verse 45. Now, from the sixth hour, there was darkness over all the land unto the ninth hour. So the darkness that covered Jerusalem happened at Calvary on the day of the crucifixion. And we see it again here in Revelation chapter 6. Let's just go back a second to Joel chapter 2. Joel chapter 2, verse 30 and 31. I will show, the, I will show uh, wonders in the heavens and the earth, blood and fire and the pillars of smoke. The sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord come. Well, it can't be the first advent. It can't be 70 AD. It's got to be the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Turn to Isaiah 13. Isaiah chapter 13, verses 9 and 10. Behold, the day of the Lord cometh, cruel both with wrath and fierce anger, to lay the land desolate, and he shall destroy the sinners thereof out of it. For the stars of heaven and the constellations thereof shall not give their light. The sun shall be darkened in his going forth, and the moon shall not cause her light to shine. So there's this supernatural darkness again at the second advent. Isaiah 34. Isaiah 34. Isn't it amazing how the Old Testament, how how so much of the Old Testament is pointing forward to the second advent, the second coming of Jesus Christ. And this is the Old Testament you know, and you get these hyper dispensationalists saying, "Oh, it's only Paul says it's only." Listen, there's so much future stuff and so much future material in the Old Testament, so we've got to keep going back and rightly dividing it here. Isaiah 34 verse 4, and all the host of heaven shall be dissolved, and the heavens shall be rolled together as a scroll, and all their hosts shall fall down as the leaf falleth off from the vine, and as a falling fig. From the fig tree, you've read about the figs, the untimely shaking of the tree through the wind. Here it is again, in Isaiah. Isaiah, a mini Bible, remember? Larkin writes, and it's very interesting, those of you that read um, Clarence Larkin, because he's excellent on all this as well. They say the granddaddy of prophecy, I'm sure there was before him, but he was, he was excellent in what he did. He said, it's interesting to compare Christ's Olivet Discourse, which is Matthew 24, verses 1 to 30, with the six seals of Revelation 6, verse 1 to 17. And in his book, he's, um, we haven't got time to go through this, I wanted to walk through Romans and rush through Revelation, but it's very difficult to do. Um, He's he's put the comparison between the Matthew 24 and the Revelation chapter 6, and how it ties up. Amazing. Again, if you you can get hold of um, Clarence Larkin's work, I'd definitely recommend that. Most prophecy prophecy teachers, 95% of their material comes from Clarence Larkin. And I think he died in the 1920s. So he was talking about Israel becoming a nation well before it ever did. Um, He was an amazing, probably one of the best prophecy teachers ever. Um, Back to Revelation chapter 6, verse 12. And I beheld when he had opened the sixth seal, and lo, there was a great earthquake, and the sun became black as sackcloth of hair, and the moon became as blood. And the stars of heaven fell onto the earth, even as a fig tree cast of untimely figs when she is shaken of a mighty wind, and the heaven departed as a scroll, we just read that in Isaiah, when it rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places, and the kings of the earth and the great men and the rich men and the chief captain and the mighty men and every bondman, every freeman hid themselves in the dens and, the, and in the rocks of the mountains. 
Somebody once made me smile. They said, um, you know, do you believe, uh, they were talking to this preacher, do you believe in cavemen? You know, right at the start, and they're talking about millions and billions of years old. And he said, no, the cavemen, but they're going to be cavemen in the future. And the, they're here. This is the cavemen. They're going to be hiding in the caves from the Lord. There was no such thing as like the cavemen, you know, Neanderthal and all that kind of stuff. So, here, um, verse... Uh, 16, the mountains, the rocks fall on us, hide us from the face of him that sits on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of his wrath is come and who shall be able to stand? Very interesting, um, because again, these amillennialists and people that don't believe, um, that they believe this is talking about um, uh, the destruction of Jerusalem in AD 70. Here, this was written, right, this is not the destruction of Jerusalem because this was written 20 years after AD 70. So it's not talking about the destruction. So it's future. We're we're reading about prophecy that is future. And notice in verse 16 and 17 the word wrath. This is the great day of the Lamb's, the Lamb's wrath. And it follows all this heavenly phenomena. Proving it couldn't have happened back in Acts chapter 2. Because the Lamb's day of wrath didn't happen in Acts chapter 2. At the first coming, God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. But at the second coming, you have the day of vengeance. The advent, the second advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go back to Isaiah 63. Isaiah 63, verse 1 to 6. Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from um, Bozrah? This that is glorious in his apparel, travelling in the greatness of his strength. I that speak in righteousness, mighty to save. Wherefore art thou red in thine apparel? Isn't it interesting? We said about Santa Claus has a red suit. Where do they get that from? And white wool hair. They get it from the scriptures, a counterfeit. And thy garments are like him that treadeth in the wine fat. I have trodden the winepress alone, and of the people there was none with me, for I will tread them in mine anger and trample them in my fury, and their blood shall be sprinkled upon my garments, and I will stain all my raiment. For the day of vengeance, where else can you fit that in history? There is no other place except the second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. Is mine heart and the year of my redeemed is come. And I looked and there was none to help and I wondered that there was none to uphold. Therefore mine own arm brought salvation unto me and my fury upheld me. And I will tread down the people in mine anger and make them um, drunk in my fury. And I'll bring down their strength to the earth. There is a great note here in Ruckman's Reference Bible. Let me just turn there on Isaiah 63. 63 verse 1. 63.1. Who is that? Who is this that cometh from Edom with dyed garments from um, Bozra? That this is glorious in his apparel. Travelling in the greatness of his strength, I that speak in righteous mighty to say. Rotman writes, this verse, the verse here, deals with Christ's path at the second second advent from Mount Sinai, and he's put C notes in Deuteronomy 33.2 and Judges 5.5, Habakkuk 3.3, up through the king's highway, Numbers 20.14-17, in Edom to cross the Jordan, where Joshua crossed with the Ark of the Covenant, see the note in Joshua 3.6, and land on the Mount of Olives, Zechariah 14, verse 1-4. to and also Isaiah 19, verse 1. So it's the path, it says the second coming, the path of the second advent. And he's written a book on that, or a booklet on that, the path of the second advent. That's definitely worth reading. How the Lord comes back, where he comes back, where he'll tread, where he drinks from the, the brook. And um, I think he says that he tr- tramples over a Muslim graveyard. It's incredible. You want to get that. So this second coming is the day of vengeance. It's not the first advent. He comes as the um, a uh, lamb. He comes in this day of vengeance as the lion of the tribe of Judah. Vengeance. The advent of the Lord Jesus Christ. It's terrifying. It's petrifying. It's horrific. It's indescribable. It is such a catastrophic time, look at verse 14, it says, the heaven departed the scroll and it rolled together and every mountain and island were moved out of their places. 
Every mountain and island will move out of their places. You've never seen anything like this. You can't fit this in any other place except the second advent. And then note verse 15. Kings. Great men. Rich men. Chief. Captains. Mighty men. Every bondman. Every freeman. They did what? I put down here, which one are you? Thank God we're not going to be here. We're pre-trib. Without doubt. But imagine being one of those. Maybe you're one of them. Maybe one of you is a rich man tonight. Maybe one of you is a king. (laughs) Well, you think you are. (laughs) A great man. They did what? These people in this verse, what did they do? Did they do Acts 16, 31? Turn there. Is this what they were doing? They're they're seeing all this, you know, heavenly phenomena come. They're seeing the the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ at the second advent. Did they do, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved? Did they do that? Did they do Acts 2.38, repent and be baptized for the remission of sins? Did they do that when they see all this stuff going on and the Lord coming back? What about 2 Corinthians? How about that one? 2 Corinthians chapter 6. Can we keep that quiet, please? Verse 2, for he saith, I have heard thee in a time accepted, and in the day of salvation now have succored thee. Behold, now is the accepted time. Behold, now is the day of salvation. Did they do that? Was it their day of salvation when he's coming back? The lamb that is now the lion of the tribe of Judah in the day of vengeance? Or did they do, it made me smile on this one, Matthew 11. Turn there, Matthew chapter 11. Come unto me, all ye that are labour and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Is that going to happen at this specific time? Not a chance. Not a chance. Look at what they did, verse 16. And said to the mountains and rocks, Fall on us, and hide us from the face of him that sitteth on the throne, and from the wrath of the Lamb. They're petrified. And they're asking to be hid. Sheltered, get away from the wrath of the Lamb. And it, it just made me think of two verses here. Turn to 2 Corinthians 5. 2 Corinthians chapter 5. Verse 11. Knowing therefore the terror of the Lord, we persuade men. The terror of the Lord. And Hebrews 12. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 29. For our God is a consuming fire. This is a day of vengeance. This is like the terror of the Lord being unleashed. The power of God. His first coming in John 1.29, he's the Lamb of God which taketh away the sin of the world. His second coming, this day of vengeance, he's the Lion of the tribe of Judah, Revelation 5.5. There's no comparison. In Matthew 21... This is a day that is going to be just horrific. I can't even think of words to describe it. Matthew 21, 44. And whosoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. Yes, thank the Lord we can. In this time we fall on him and we're broken. And um, he saves us. We're sinners. Yet here, whomsoever it shall fall, it will grind into a powder. Do you know what that's doing? That's separating the two advents. On whomsoever shall fall on this stone shall be broken. The stone which the um, the builders rejected, the chief cornerstone, that's the Lord Jesus Christ. You've fallen on him, you're broken, um, you, you must be born again. The blood atonement, the Lamb of God which takes away the sin. And then, whomsoever it shall fall, this stone, this rock, it will grind into a powder. That's the second advent. At the second coming of Jesus Christ, he's the man of war. He comes killing and destroying his enemies. And nothing and nobody is going to stop him. Rockman did a a, a shirt once. It says, um, a big big picture in the front. I had it once. I um, outgrew it because of my muscles. And um, and this uh, this, uh, picture of the Lord Jesus Christ on this white stallion with a a sword drawn um, coming out of his mouth. And it says, um, guess who's coming back? And boy, is he mad. Nobody's going to stop him. 
You're not going to touch him. He's going to destroy everything and anyone that's in his way. Nothing, it doesn't matter about governments, armies, nuclear weapons, drones. You can have whatever. You can throw your works at him and it won't touch him. He is absolute power. On, he is total, omnipotent, all-knowing, all-powerful God. And he's coming back. And he's going to sort the mess of the world out. If you think Donald Trump is going to sort the mess of this world out, you're mad. Only one person's going to do it, and it's Jesus Christ. And it's going to happen at the second coming. That's when it's going to happen. Thank God I don't have to go through all this that we are talking about, because this would petrify me. Imagine, imagine, I mean, I don't know what these post-tribbers must be thinking. They've got to go through some of this stuff and think, man, I'm going to be there on this world. You, you, you enjoy yourself. <laughs> but I'm certainly not going to be there. There is only one true victor. And that is the Lord Jesus Christ. That's almighty God. Jesus Christ is almighty God. Turn to Revelation 19. I mean, this is exciting, folks. This is exciting. Revelation 19. Revelation 19, verse 11. Look at this. Remember, we said heaven opens twice in Revelation. One at the rapture, Revelation 4, somebody goes up. One in Revelation 19, it opens, at heaven's door opens again and somebody comes down. And look at this, and I saw heaven open, this is the second time, behold a white horse. Now that's not a counterfeit, this is the true white horse with the true Lord on. And he that sat upon him was called faithful, notice capitals and true. And in righteousness he doth judge and make war. When was the last time you heard the Church of England sermons? Or Justin Welby, (laughs) preaching on Jesus Christ making war. They're poofters, all of them. His eyes were as a flame of fire, and on his head were many crowns. And he had a name written that no man knew but he himself. And he was clothed with a vesture dipped in blood. And his name is called The Word, capital W, John 1, 1, of God. And the armies which were in heaven followed him upon white horses, clothed in fine linen, white and clean. D keeps saying to um, us, I want to ride a horse, I want to ride a horse. I said, wait till the second advent, you'll get your chance. If you think I'm paying for horse lessons now, you've got another thing coming. Let's get them free of charge at the second advent. Yeah? Not that I'm tight. I'm not saying that. This is, this is unbelievable. This is, he's coming back. He's coming back. And out of his mouth, look at this, goeth a sharp sword, that with it he should smite the nations. He's coming killing and destroying. You think of all the, the organisations that set up the UN and all this stuff. He's coming to destroy the lot. Mankind thinks he's sorted it. Man, you know, they, all, they put all these laws in, these governments. Like, he's going to destroy everything and set it up, starting from scratch. And he shall rule them with a rod of iron. You step out of place, that's it. And he treads the winepress of the fierceness and, the, of, and wrath of almighty God. And he hath on his vesture and on his thigh a name written, King of kings and Lord of lords. So even after all this stuff is happening on earth... This bunch in verse 15, look at this, verse 15, kings, great men, rich men, chief captains, mighty men, every bondman, every free man. This bunch, after seeing all this stuff that's going on, you would think, you would think that they would repent of their sins and turn to God. Surely! But they don't. They hide. Just like Adam, when he sinned, hid. They don't cry out to God for salvation, they hide. Isn't it amazing that the human heart, human beings, how hard we are and how stubborn we are? Turn to 1 Samuel 15. You can't believe it. 1 Samuel 15, after all this stuff. Verse 23. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft... And stubbornness is as iniquity and idolatry. Because thou hast rejected the word of the Lord, he hath also rejected thee from being king. King, Stubbornness, iniquity, rebellion. Man's heart. What's changed? Repented not. And then I put in just, and I picked up just on a few here, repented not. Why don't people repent? How come some people get the gospel straight away and some don't? Look at Matthew 11, verse 20. Some of people in your families aren't saved, and you've been praying for them for years. But you got saved perhaps the first time you ever heard the gospel. Isn't it amazing? 
83 years old my dad is, and he still hasn't got the gospel. He's been told it a number of times now, but still rejects the Lord. Matthew 11, verse 20. Then began he, the Lord, to upbraid the cities wherein most of his mighty works were done, because they repented not, even when the Lord was on earth. Look at Matthew 21. Verse 28 to 32. Matthew 21, 28 to 32. But what think ye? A certain man had two sons, and he came to the first and said, Son, go work today in my vineyard. He answered and said, I will not. But afterward he repented and went. And he came to the second and said, Likewise. And he answered and said, I go, sir, and went not. Whither of them twain did the father will of his father? They say unto him, The first. Jesus said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that the publicans and the harlots go into the kingdom of God before you. For John came unto you in the way of righteousness, and ye believed him not. But the publicans and the harlots believed him, and ye, when ye had seen it, repented not afterward, that ye might believe him. Isn't that incredible? That some repented and some didn't? People you've shared the gospel with still didn't repent. Repented not. Turn to Revelation 2, verse 18. Revelation 2, 18 to 23. Look at this. And unto the angel of the church in Thyatira write, These things saith the Son of God, who hath his eyes like unto a flame of fire, and his feet are like fine brass. I know thy works, and charity, and service, and faith, and thy patience, and thy works, and the last to be more than the first. Notwithstanding, I have, I have a few things against thee, because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel, which calleth herself a prophetess, to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication, and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. And I gave her space to repent of her fornication, and she repented not." Behold, I will cast her into a bed, and them that commit adultery with her into great tribulation, except they repent of their deeds. And I will kill her children with death, and all the, ch- um, all the churches shall know that I am he which searcheth the reins and hearts, and I will give unto every one of you according to your works. Think that he gave the opportunity to repent, she repented not, and um, just like um, all through the Old Testament, Israel turning away from God, he gives them chance, then they repent, and then they don't repent, and then they go back into idolatry, and they go back into fornication, and all this stuff. Look at Revelation chapter 9. And unfortunately, I say unfortunately, I love it, I'm going to have to read this to you, listen, listen to this. I said we've got a lot to go through, I'm going to have to move pretty quick. Look at Revelation 9. And the fifth angel sounded, and I saw a star fall from heaven unto the earth, and to him was given the key of the bottomless pit. And he opened the bottomless pit, and there rose a smoke out of the pit, as the smoke of a great furnace, and the sun and the air were darkened by reason of smoke of the pit. And there came out of the smoke locusts upon the earth, and upon them was given power, Oh, as the scorpions of the earth have power. And it was commanded them, they should not hurt the grass of the earth, neither any green thing, neither any tree, but only those men which have not the seal of God in their foreheads. We'll get to this perhaps next week or the week after, a few weeks perhaps down the line. And to them it was given that they should not kill them, <clears throat> but that they should be tormented five months, and their torment was as the torment of a scorpion, when he striketh a man. And in those days shall men seek death, and shall not find it, and shall desire to die, and shall, and death shall flee from them. And the shapes of the locusts were like unto horses prepared unto battle, and on their heads were as it were crowns like gold, and their faces were as the faces of men, and they had hair as the hair of women. That's long hair. It's a shame unto them, a man to have long hair. And the teeth were as the teeth of lions, and they had breastplates as it were breastplates of iron, and the sound of their wings was as the sound of chariots and of many horses running to battle. We talked about this a while back, and it freaked us all out. <laughs> And they had tails like unto scorpions, and there were stings in their tails, and they had power, and their power was to hurt men five months. Five being number of death. And they had a king over them, which is the angel of the bottomless pit, whose name in the Hebrew tongue is Abaddon, but in the Greek tongue he, um, hath his name Apollyon. Listen to this. One woe is past, and behold, there come two woes more hereafter. 
And the sixth angel sounded, and I heard a voice from the four horns of the golden altar, which is before God, saying to the sixth angel, which had the trumpet, loose the four angels, which are bound in the great river Euphrates. And the four angels were loosed, which were prepared for an hour and a day, and a month and a year, for to slay the third part of men. The third? A third? You imagine being here and seeing all this stuff going on? Let's keep reading. And the number of the army of the horsemen were 200,000 thousand. 200 million. And I heard the number of them. And thus I saw the horses in the vision, and then that sat on them, having breastplates of fire and of jacinth and brimstone, and the heads of the horses were as the heads of lions, and out of their mouths issued fire and smoke and brimstone. By these three was the third part of men killed. Folks, could you imagine there's seven billion on the earth? Two-thirds die? By the fire and by the smoke and by the brimstone which issued out of their mouths. For their power is in their mouth and in their tails. For their tails were like unto serpents and, and had heads with them. They do hurt. And the rest of the men which were not killed by these plagues, yet they turned to the Lord and got saved. You would think so, wouldn't you, if you saw all this stuff? Man alive, if you're fighting for survival during Daniel's 70 week, the Great Tribulation, Jacob's Troll, if you were fighting for survival and you've seen all this supernatural, the weirdest stuff, the most terrifying stuff you've ever seen in your life, wouldn't you turn to God and get saved? By these plagues, yet, repented not. Of the works of their hands, and they should not worship devils and idols of gold and silver, brass and stone, of wood which can neither see nor hear nor walk. Neither repented they of their murders, nor of their sorceries, nor of their fornication, nor of their... I can't believe it. (laughs) Mankind. Turn to Revelation 16. What on earth is mankind like? Look at this. Revelation 16, 9... To 11. And men were scorched with great heat and blasphemed the name of God, which hath power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And the fifth angel poured out his vial upon the seat of the beast, and his kingdom was full of darkness, and they gnawed their tongues for pain, and blasphemed the God of heaven because of their pains and their sores, and repented not of their deeds. Folks, I can't get my head round this. Why on earth don't you turn to God? For salvation. There's an amazing verse in Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 5. What on earth is up with the human race? Talk about sin, hardness. Do you know what it comes down to? One word. Pride. Jeremiah 5 verse 3. Look at this. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they have not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they have refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock, they have refused to return. I don't get it. You correct a child, and if he doesn't change it, you correct him again, he doesn't change. Man alive, he's a a backward, wayward child. And it all comes back to pride. Jeremiah 17, 9 says, The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked, who can know it? The heart is deceitful above all things, and desperately wicked. Genesis 6, look at this, Genesis 6, <clears throat> verse 5. And God saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. Oh, well, we've improved a lot since then. You haven't improved one single bit. You're just the same. I'm going to say something, I'm going to offend all of you in a minute, and I'm looking forward to it. Romans 7 verse 18, because we're just the same. For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. That's what Paul said. There's nothing good in me, he said. And I'm telling you, there's nothing good in me. Matthew 12, turn there, Matthew 12. We're getting Cain tonight through the scriptures. And if you allow that to beat you and break you, you'll be a much better person. Matthew 12 verse 34. What is it? A person who thinks himself to be something when he's nothing, deceiveth himself. Galatians 6, 3. That's just it. You're nothing. If you think you're something, you've been deceived. Matthew 12, 34. O generation of vipers, how can ye, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth 
speaketh. The depravity of the human heart. I was talking to a few of you beforehand, and I've been thinking about this this week. You don't know what you're capable of. None of you. Not me, not none of you. You think you do, but you don't. You've never been tested to know what you were capable of. We've lived, some of us perhaps have had harder lives, I understand that, some people have horrendous lives, but you've never been pushed, you've never been in like a concentration camp, you've never seen people that you love killed in front of you or tortured in front of you, you know nothing about this. You don't know what you're capable of. Could you commit murder? God, not me. You don't know that. Sexual immorality? Adultery? Fornication? Suicide? We judge people because they've done these things, but you don't know what you're capable of. And neither do I. Until you're at breaking point, we just don't know. We're so cocooned in our little, you know, our lovely warm homes with our carpets, wall-to-wall carpets, and we're so cocooned, we don't know what we're capable of. But when the breaking point hits, then you find out the real you. It's unbelievable. You hear things on the news, you think, how on earth can somebody do that? How on earth can somebody go through that? You don't know until you're tested. You see, all this stuff on YouTube, people, Christians attacking each other, all this pathetic, sitting in their little rooms with their little box cameras on the thing, making out they're, you know, they're somebody, they're pathetic. Pathetic. People live on YouTube. What an... It's like you might as well play, play computer games. You're, you're in this little fantasy world. Get out there in the real world. What we're going through here in Revelation 6, it's taken us clear through the tribulation. Listen to this carefully. There's this stuff coming up now. If you get this, this will make Revelation so much more clearer for you. It's really helped me out by studying this. Listen to this carefully. Revelation 6 takes us clear through the tribulation. It takes you from the first year to the last year in one chapter. But I thought Revelation was chronological. Then you're wrong. You need to understand this. It's chronological in parts, but not from Revelation 1 to Revelation 22. The book of Revelation, hear me out, take this down. The book of Revelation takes you through the tribulation several times. Actually, it takes you through the tribulation, Jacob's trouble, Daniel 7, four times. It goes over it once, then back, then over it again, then back. Then four times it takes you through the tribulation in the book of Revelation. There is so much confusion over this. This is why the post-tribbers get it wrong. Amillennialists don't believe in the millennium. They get it wrong. The book of Revelation gives four accounts of the second coming of Jesus Christ, exactly as Matthew, Mark, Luke and John give four accounts of his first coming. The first account of the tribulation is Revelation 5, chapters 5 and 6. Chapter 7, and I'm going to have to try and pronounce this word, is parenthetical. Parenthetical. In other words, there is no mention of the seals in chapter 7. Up to here, you have been dealing with the seals, Revelation 6. You come through the sixth seal, listen carefully, in Revelation 6 verse 12, and yet the seventh seal does not occur until Revelation 8 verse 1. Did you get that? So the events recorded in Revelation 7 are a gap telling about something that takes place during the tribulation. It must be something that takes place during the seals because when you get to Revelation 6 verse 12 to 17, the tribulation is over and the wrath of God is coming on the day of his wrath. But when we get to Revelation 7, we have a place where before all these events take place, 144,000 Jews are sealed. So Revelation 7 is telling you something that takes place during the six seals. The chronology then closes with the seventh seal at the beginning of Revelation 8. You may want to get the CD and listen to that again. If you get that, that will really help you. It gets better, hopefully not more confusing. Listen to this. So that the first account of the tribulation is Revelation 5 and Revelation 6. And chapter 7 is... Parenthetical. 
It's like a, a parenthesis in brackets. Something happens, and then you find that the seventh, what is it, the seventh seal we said it starts in Revelation chapter 8. The next complete account of the tribulation is found in Revelation 8 to Revelation 11, 8, 9, 10, 11, ending in Revelation 11 verse 15. Yet chapter 10 is a parenthesis again. It's in brackets. The third one, we have another account of the tribulation, beginning in Revelation 12 and running through Revelation 14, ending in Revelation 14, verse 20. And the fourth, the last account of the tribulation, is Revelation 15 to 19. Each time the Holy Spirit takes you through the tribulation, he puts the emphasis on a different thing. Four times in the book of Revelation... We go through the tribulation from start to finish. That's where the confusion comes with a lot of prophecy teachers. For example, listen carefully. In Revelation 5 to 6, he takes you through the seals. In Revelation 8 to 11, he takes you through the trumpets. In Revelation 12 to 14, he takes you through the activities of the Antichrist. And in Revelation 15 to 19... He takes you through the seven vials and the destruction of Babylon the Great. And each account goes through the tribulation from start to finish with some parenthetical material inserted. And those chapters that are in the parentheses, in the brackets, are chapters 7, 10, 12 and 13. I said to you it would be quite confusing, yet if you can get hold of this, this will open up the book of Revelation for you in a new light. Because the people think it's just chronological, and one chapter follows another, and that is just this chronology, and it isn't. It goes over the tribulation from start to finish, and then it does it all over again, then it does it all over again, four times it goes through the tribulation. Daniel's 70th week, Jacob's trouble. If you don't rightly divide the scriptures, that's where the confusion comes. That's why Kent Hovind, Bob the Boob Mitchell, and all the other whackheads go wrong. And Anderson the Nutcase, they go wrong because they don't rightly divide the scriptures, and they follow this stuff, and they think we're going to go through the tribulation, and you're not. I am waiting for the rapture. I'm waiting to hear my name. John Edrick Davis, come up hither, and I am out of this place like a shot with the Lord, to meet the Lord in the air. I will not go through any part of the tribulation. You call it the great tribulation, pre wrath call it whatever you want. Uh, I'm not going through this seven years. I'm out of here. If you want to go through it, by all means, enjoy yourself. But after what we've just read in Revelation, I want to be as far away from that as I possibly can. I am sealed under the day of redemption. I'm waiting for the redemption of my body. I am, I'm saved, spiritually speaking, I'm in heaven right now. I'm just waiting for the, that, that day, the calling, uh, the Lord coming back. He redeem my body, I get a new body, and I go to the heavenly Jerusalem. And I can't wait. We'll leave it there. We'll pick up from Revelation chapter 7, I think, next time. 7 verse 1. Let us pray.